Michelle and Scott up, please. Thank you. We appreciate you guys uh, stepping in, helping out with Pastor, and being part of the um, appreciation as well. And we appreciate you guys being here. Okay, thank you. Is there a Jamie Payne in the house? I don't think Cindy's with you today, so. That's for all the times that you step up and do and help us. Uh, appreciate these guys as well and step in and do what you need to do. We appreciate you being an associate pastor here. Thank you. And Pastor Will and Sister Pat. And here's a gift from us. And I also have a couple more gifts here. Uh, this one here is this Pastor Pat. This is for Pastor Will. Thank you. <laughs> and we have a whole bunch of cards we'll get to you guys here pretty soon. So And we deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate both of you guys and everything that you do every day. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, if you can't tell, we absolutely appreciate our pastors here. Um, they are a blessing to us. You know. It's an amazing thing what God does when, when uh, people uh, listen to uh, the call that's on their lives. And, and man, it has just been amazing to see how, you know, each one of our pastors has made such a huge impact on, on the lives of people here. So we are very uh, grateful that God has brought them here um, and that God has put them here. Uh, I'm grateful that, you know, our pastor's here because, you know, that means I was here. <laughs> but uh, let's go. We're going to go ahead and we're going to worship the Lord this morning. Uh, so if you want to stand with us this morning, mm, I don't know about you, but being in God's presence is something I want to do this morning. Amen. Amen. Whoo. It's good stuff.
like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what heaven looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise We'll see you break down every wall Watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lifted high With all creation I can't hold back my praise, gotta let it out. I can't hold back my praise, gotta let it out. I can't hold back my praise, gotta let it out. I can't hold back my praise, gotta let it out. I can't hold back my praise, gotta let it out. I can't hold back my praise, gotta let it out. I can't hold back my praise Gotta let it out I can't hold back my praise Gotta let it out Gotta let it out Yeah, yeah, yeah This is what living feels like This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you this what living looks like. This what freedom feels like. This what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This what living looks like. This what freedom feels like. This what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This what living looks like. This what freedom feels like. This what heaven sounds like. We Yes, Lord. Mm. Come on, put your hands together this morning.
And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus is nothing possible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Yeah. When all I see is the cross, God, you see you now.
come on. There's nothing better than you. There is nothing better than you, God. Oh, God, you are so good. Come on, lift your hands this morning and just love on the Father. God, you are good. You are so good. There is nothing better than you. There is nothing better than you. We lift your name, God. We lift you up. You are so good to us. Oh, God, you are so good to us.
say, God, I am available. God, I'm available. God, I want what you want. I need what you have. God, I lay it all down at your feet this morning. I need you. I want you, God. I'm available this morning. I'm available, God. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. You can have it all. You can have it all. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. You can have it all. You 
Yes, Lord, you can have it all. I surrender everything to you right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take out your communion cup and prepare to receive it? You know, God can speak to us in so many ways. You can be seated if you want while you take your communion. I know it's kind of clumsy to handle that. And then in just a minute, we'll stand up again and sing that song one more time. God can speak to us in so many ways. He proved that to me this week when he spoke to me through a box of hair product. On the side of the box, it said, Confident is the new beautiful. So, man, I reach for that box. <laughs> where you get confidence, you're holding it in your hand. This is where we get our confidence. We are confident in the blood of Jesus. We are confident in his sacrifice for us. And it causes us to be beautiful. Women are really bad, but men are too, about self-deprecation. Okay? It's like you look in the mirror and you think, I am so old and so fat. And then you go to do something and it's like, my memory just isn't what it should be. Or why can't I stay focused on something? Why do I always do this wrong? Or you're in a relationship and it's like, why do I always say the wrong thing? And we're just constantly, constantly, constantly. spoke something to me. You know, last week we had the privilege of uh, going on a really wonderful trip um, to Mexico. It was provided by a foundation that just, you know, invites pastors to come. And I had a lot of time to just be quiet before the Lord. And you know the most important thing he said to me? He said, I'm pleased with you. That was huge for me because I'm that person who's constantly saying I'm too old I'm too fat I'm too single focused I can't remember things everything I can't handle my money right I can't do this right I can't keep house I can't cook meals I just can't 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 but you know what is really true God loves me just the way I am I have that argument with the Lord real often, especially about that single focus thing. Lord, why did you make me this way? That my brain just locks in on one thing and I can't think of anything else but that one thing. But that was his decision to make me that way. And you know what? That is not what I need to repent of. Because that is not sin. Sin is when we go against the things that the Lord has spoken to us, especially things concerning his word. Being ugly is not a sin. Having bad hair is not a sin. Falling over your own feet is not a sin. We are who we are, and God loves us the way we are. What we need to repent of are the things that are actual sin and the other things about ourselves we need to just realize that God loves us just the way we are doesn't matter what the scales say doesn't matter what looks like in the mirror doesn't matter what's on the report card doesn't matter what's on the page that I am loved because of this covenant I am in him and he is in me. And that is what counts. And it makes me confident. I'm feeling rather beautiful this morning. Because I'm confident that my
my sins are forgiven. I may not be a perfect person, but I'm a perfect spirit because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can be too. Let confidence be your new your beautiful, but not from a hair box. From the blood of Christ. Would you just Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that what he did for me when he died on the cross paid for all my sin so I repent of sin and I receive forgiveness you will be my God and I will be your child in Jesus name bless the cup, you may receive it. Be confident and beautiful. God loves you just the way you are. Lord, everything that's within us, Lord, you can have it all. Lord, we lay our lives down as your children, Lord. 
Lord, because you're the great I am, Lord Jesus, and you have everything good for us, Father God. And you work out everything for your good, Father God. So today, here we are, Lord, to lay down everything that we have, Lord. Just to stand in your presence, Lord Jesus, and worship you this morning. We give you everything, Father God. Lord, you're worth everything. You're worth every breath that's within our lungs. And we praise you this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Sometimes it just seems like, why go into announcements when we're, worship is that good, amen? But I have a couple announcements for you. So say next Sunday. Say next Sunday. If you are a new believer or a new person that's been attending uh, Revival Center in the last six months, or maybe you're somebody that has come back, has been attending for the last six months, we are having a party for you. Who likes a party? Amen. So that's next Sunday. Uh, we'd like to invite you. We're going to have a little bit of food for you and stuff, and we just want to glorify you and honor you and say thank you. Amen. Uh, all right, now say October 29th. You see, repetitive is good sometimes because then we can get it. Amen. <laughs> so October 29th, we are having our missions banquet. Amen. Now, I get excited when we have missionaries come to the church because how many know that the kingdom of God is bigger than Revival Center? Amen. Amen. So, you know, when these missionaries come, we get to hear about what's going on in other parts of the world. Amen. We get to see what God is doing. Amen. We get to hear how God is healing people, blessing people, how people are coming to the Lord. So we're going to have food. How many like food? Food. Amen. Uh, and, you know, another thing is that when the missionaries are here, you get to go right up and talk to them, mm -hmm. ask them questions, rub bubbles with them. Amen. Amen. So that's a good thing. So those are two of the announcements. Uh, let's go right into tithe and offering. Let's go right into tithe and offering. <laughs> All right. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. So... This week, I was just kind of studying on some things, and uh, I love when God talks about covenant. Because when God makes a covenant with his people, there's nothing that can separate it from you or I. And so in Genesis 17, 6 through 7, God is talking to Abraham and says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. How many of you know that's a good thing? Amen. And I will make you a nation, I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in this generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. So he's, he's, he's telling Abraham, look it, I'm making a covenant with you. It's a blessing that I'll never take away from you. Amen. Well, in Galatians 3, 23 through 29, it says, For you are all sons, and then I add this, daughters of God. That's what the word of God says. Through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you who were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to get a hold of this because I'm going back to covenant talking here. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen? So that means that the covenant that God made with Abraham is still the same covenant that operates today in your, yours and my lives. Because we are in Christ and we are joint heirs with Christ. Amen? So this morning as you give, we have three ways to give. Text to give, 810-202-0605. You can also give on the back of each uh, chair. There's envelopes. Fill those out. You can place them right into these baskets we hear in the front and the back. And if you want to drop it in the mail, we're still getting email. Amen. So let me pray over you as you give. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your people, Lord. 
as they give into your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Lord, it stays here on earth, Lord, but it goes and it touches people's lives, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, you multiply it beyond all measure, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the Abrahamic covenant that you set in motion, that we as joint heirs with Christ, we are part of that covenant. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before you go, Pastor Scott, I just wanted to um, tell you something that you probably just don't know. And uh, you give every week, and you give faithfully, and you say, well, you know what, we're glad that the lights are on and the air conditioning works. I hope it's working today. And um, you, we're glad that all that happens. And you may wonder, you know, well, what about, you know, what if there's uh, more than enough? Here's what I want you to know. Every single month, money is set aside by Revival Center to invest in the kingdom outside of Revival Center. Every month. And so that you can know a little bit about some of the things that we have recently done. Uh, we invested in the call to all that took place in the city park down in August where churches gathered together. We invested money into that. If you want to think of some other things that are kind of cool that we had an opportunity to do. Last month, we invested money, enough money so that 20 churches can start a brand new ministry in the state of Michigan, a brand new ministry. We also invested $1,000 in the chaplain's fund so that the next four months of chaplaincy at, for CAMA at the hospital is already paid for and covered. That's what we do with that money. We invest it. You say you give it? Listen to me. I don't want you to give to Revival Center. I want you to invest here. Because when you invest, there's a return on the investment. That's kind of how it works. And it's a kingdom return. Let me share with you something we just, I mean, we just approved. We just approved $1,000 to send to an inner city church in Connecticut that is starting Christian Bible clubs in their schools in that area. So, so we're spreading it far and wide because we want to have our investment in the kingdom. And I can tell you this much, when you get to heaven, there's going to be a time when somebody's going to come and say, you were part of Revival Center? Did you know that this and this happened and I came to Christ because of this Bible club that you helped start? Did you know that God is going to give you the opportunity to know some of that stuff? And so, so when you give, it's not just giving, it's investing. Because when you do invest it, we make sure it gets reinvested. It goes out of here. It's not, this place is not a dammed up place. This is a place where the water flows freely. And when it comes in, it goes out. And it goes out to make a difference in the kingdom. Amen. Just want you to know. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Ooh, made me excited just thinking about it. How many of you have one of these cards? If you don't have one of the cards, our uh, ushers will make sure you get a card because you need the card right now. Look at the person next to you and say, I need one of these cards right now. I know that some of you took it home, and uh, you've been using it at home, and, uh, and uh, we want you to use these every single day. We have started uh, the I Am series and and what we're talking about and what we're going to be talking about through the end of 2021 is we are going to be talking about who we are in Christ okay and what we are doing in Christ and every one of these proclamations is from the word of God in fact the um, the actual scripture that it comes from is found right there and I want you to be looking up those scriptures Betty Betty Raymond stand up come come here come here come here I need a microphone for Betty. I got a mic. I got a mic. It's number three. Where are you at, Betty? No, come here. Come here. Come here. What part of come here didn't you understand, Betty? Come here. I love you. I want you to tell them what happened this last week as you began to make these declarations. Well, uh, you all remember when Pastor told us that well, about these cards, and uh, we, he wanted us to read them every single day and say them out loud and speak it every day. Well, I started doing that right, right away, right, when he told us to do that. And as I went on, there was things that spoke to me from this word, 
but as I went on, I started feeling something happening in my body. And I had to have some tests done. The tests came back perfect. Thank you, Lord. And it's because of Thank God's you, Lord. Word. It's because of God's word. Speak it out loud. There's power in the word of God. There's power. And when he says, when it says here, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, there's no room for disease or anything here. Not when God says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So I'm just telling you that there's power. You need to read it, get it into your, into your heart and your mind and know that this is truth. Amen. Thank you, Betty. All right. That is so cool. And so, and so, I want you to take your card. You got your card? Here's what we're doing with this stuff. We read it. We think about it. We say it. We read it. We think about it. We say it. So, let's read it. Are you ready? I am a child of God. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a person of virtue. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I am putting my armor on now. I am convinced that all things work together for good. I am living the abundant life in Jesus. I am a new person. I am a doer of the word. I am guarded by God's peace. I am an overcomer. I am praying for my enemies, okay? And, uh, you know, I, you say, Pastor, what are you trying to do? Here's what I know. There are 70,000 thoughts that go through your head every single day. Not all of them are good. You say, well, how do you know that? I don't know about your head. I just know about mine. And there's a whole lot of them that have been passing through the gate that aren't so good. And I want to concentrate on the Word of God and what God says over me. And I want to begin to read it. And I want to begin to think about it. And I want to begin to say it. Because when I do that, it puts creative power into the atmosphere around me. And it changes the world in which I live. So that's why we're doing this. And, and every week you're going to hear a sermon on one of these. Now last week, Pastor Scott started us out with I am a child of God. And he shared how he came to faith in Christ and how, how as, a, as a young child he lost his mom. And, and then a, a preacher said a pretty stupid thing, you know, that God needed his mom more than he did. How many of you know that's a dumb thing to say? And we preachers say dumb things sometimes. But the thing about it, <laughs> who said amen? Oh, all right, all right. We preachers say dumb things sometimes, don't we? And the thing about it, the thing about it is, though, is this. It had a great effect on that little child. And he didn't realize or want to be a child of God until he became an adult. And the Lord called him back, pulled him in, said, you're my child. You know, we are children of God. Today we're going to talk about I am fearfully and wonderfully made, okay? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, here's the question. I've got a question for you. Are you ready for this? Here it is. If there's anything about you that you could change, what would it be? If there's anything about you that you could change, what would it be? Stephen said, not a thing. Who, who's, what? You'd be healthy, okay? Now, let me ask you a question. When you, when you look in the mirror every day you do look right when you look in the mirror every day are you checking yourself out over there Makai he's checking himself out yeah that's what guys do we check ourselves out in the mirror when you look in the mirror every day and you look at that face are the things that you would change when you think about your body, are the things that would, you would change? When you think about your intellect, your IQ, your abilities, are the things that you would change? You see, I think that the truth of the matter is, is that most of us have looked at ourselves with a bit of a critical eye. In fact, that's kind of a common thing for us to do. We look at ourselves in the mirror, and we check it out, and you know what? We see some things that need some work. And I think that in general, most of us would say, I struggle 
to relate to the 139th Psalm. I struggle to relate to that, 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 that Psalm that says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Because sometimes we don't feel that way. The 139th Psalm is written by David. David is good looking and heroic, and he's a gifted musician and a songwriter and an incredible warrior and courageous and without fear and a man after God's own heart and a great leader, and he was respected by friend and foe, and he had killed Goliath. He was in many ways legendary. And when we think about a guy like that, we're like going, all right, if I was like that, maybe I could write this, because this is what David wrote about himself. Here's what he says. You formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside. And you wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. Let's stop for a minute. Can you imagine waking up in the morning and you stumble into the bathroom and you look in the mirror for the first time and you say, you are marvelously breathtaking. <laughs> I can tell you this much, only a teenage boy could do that. Right, Mackay? Exactly. All right. And then he goes on to say, it simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created when you created me in the secret place. Carefully, skillfully, you shaped me from nothing to something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me, before I'd ever seen the light of day. The number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. And every single moment you are thinking of me. Can you imagine? Walking around thinking to yourself, every single moment, God has me on his mind. But he said that. Now, here's the thing. You've got to get this. This ends up in our Bible because it's inspired by God. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought, O oh God. Your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I awake each morning, you're still with me. When we look at stuff like that, we go, how in the world could anybody actually believe that about themselves? I would venture to say that few people who are not narcissists would talk about themselves this way. We can't control how we're born or conceived or what circumstance or home. You don't control what you look like. You don't control which hairs stay connected, which hairs get loose, which hairs go gray. You don't control your complexion, your coordination. I've always thought I was smart enough to be a great ball player if I only I was more coordinated. I had to work really hard to become as good as I was because I just didn't ever feel coordinated. Have you ever had a time when it didn't? And it doesn't seem like it gets any better. It's kind of like what you, you, you tell your arm or your leg or something to do something and it doesn't do it. How many of you have ever been in that place? It just doesn't do it in the time frame you thought it should. And you're thinking to yourself, you know what, if, I, if only I was smarter, or if only I had a different personality or, or IQ, or, 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 but quite frankly, it doesn't really matter because God still says you were created in his image. You were created in the image of one who is perfect in every way. But what does that look like? I want you to look at some pictures of some people who are fearfully and wonderfully made, created in the image of God. Created in the image of God. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Created in the image of God. Fearfully and wonderfully made. That's who they are. And we look and we say, I, I don't know if I understand it. Well, I'm hoping that by the end of this sermon today, 
we'll have a better understanding of what it means to be fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. We're going to look at a story that is found in the 29th chapter of the book of Genesis. We're not going to read all of it, but we're going to read parts of it, and we're going to kind of share with you this story. It's a story about a guy named Jacob. Jacob has had some family problems along the way, and he has stolen his brother's birthright and is on the run from his brother. His father is no longer alive, and his mother is no longer accessible to him. And he is journeying on his way, and when he is on his way, he comes across a group of shepherds that are uh, uh, they're, they're hanging out around a well, a well that still has the stone over it because they would wait until all the shepherds got there with all their sheep to open it so that the well would stay pure and so that they only had to open it once. Jacob asked the shepherds in verse 4, my brothers, where are you from? Well, we're from Haran, they replied. And he said to them, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked them, is he well? Well, yes, he is, they said. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. You are about to enter the world of romance, so get ready. This is a romantic story. So, so Jacob is now going to meet a shepherdess, the only shepherdess there. The other shepherds are all male, and, 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 and he, is, he is now going to meet her. And, and, and the Bible says in verse 10, when Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over and he rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. You say, what's so important about that? He's showing his muscles. I know what they told me. We're not supposed to roll it away until everybody's here. But the only one that's really important is here. He's flexing all over the place. And he pushes the stone away. And he says, let me help. such a great story. I'm excited about it. So he waters the sheep, and then it says this in verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel, and he began to weep aloud. He's both romantic and sensitive. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah. So she ran and told her father. You know, it's amazing what men will do to try and show off and prove their love. I heard of a lady that was on a plane, and she sat next to this guy, and she was a really beautiful lady, and he wanted to impress her. And uh, he said to her, he said, what kind of men do you like? And she said, well, I like American Indian men with their bronze skin and their high cheekbones. And she said, I like Jewish men because they're just so smart and good with money. And she said, but, you know, she said, I also kind of like southern men. And she said, by the way, what's your name? And he said, Geronimo Bernstein. But my friends call me Bubba. It's amazing what men will do. To press a lady, impress a lady. Now, as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him, and he embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him all these things. Then Laban said to him, You are my own flesh and blood. And after Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, Just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? So he's been working for Laban a whole month, he's been working without pay, and then he says, tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. We've met one. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. 
Leah had weak eyes. I think the writer is being very kind. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Do you think the only difference between the two of them was their eyes? I don't think so. I just don't think Leah was anywhere nearly as pretty. And maybe she was cross-eyed. Not sure. All I know is this. The scripture says she has weak eyes. That's how she is described. That's her major feature. How many of you would like to be described by a feature that is negative about you? Some of you have been. When you were growing up at school, somebody identified, they said this and they said that, and they kept saying it and they kept repeating it, and it embarrassed you and it hurt you, and, and it was a feature that you, after a while, you just hated it about yourself. Well, she was identified as a person in the Bible as having weak eyes, and her sister is beautiful. She has a lovely figure. So, Jacob's, or Laban, now Laban had, so Jacob was in love with Rachel, verse, verse 18, and, and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. So that you understand, in that time, that would have been about four times as much as you would normally have had to have given as a dowry for a bride. How many of you know he is love sick? He's madly in love with this girl. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Now, 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 now get this. You've got to listen to these words because we're going to get back to them later. It's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is complete, and I want to make love to her. Now let me tell you something. That is pretty graphic language for that culture. Maybe it's even graphic for ours. This is an amazing love at first sight story, and it's all true. This is not a Hallmark romance or a novel at the bookstore. This, this is not like that at all. This is not based on a true story. This is a true story. It happens in a culture where love at first sight is not normally accepted. It happens in a culture where people married for status and stability, not love. Have you ever been in love? Mm -hmm. Some of you are like going, yeah, yeah, I regret it to this day. Others are like going, no, no, it's not so bad. I, I, I'm still in love. It's amazing what a person will do for, for love. When a young lady is in love, she'll overlook the faults, failures, and pimples of her man. He has acne, but she don't see it. All of a sudden, she'll take an interest in fishing or football. She'll go wherever he goes and whatever he likes, she likes. You know why? Because she likes him. Her father may see a know-it-all going nowhere, but she sees an intelligent, strong, and resourceful hero. And some guys will get downright stupid when they are in love. They will spend money that they don't have to impress a girl they hardly know. Don't you tell me it's not true. They will show off, brag about themselves, and even write sappy poems when they are in love. <laughs> the human longing for true love is often celebrated in our culture through music and poetry and theater and art and countless movies. How many of you have ever been to a rom-com? A romantic comedy? Sure. You have, even though you didn't like it guys. It's the subject of numerous novels. Its significance cannot be ignored. In fact, I would venture to say that no culture has ever exalted romantic love as high as the one in which we now live. Romantic love is an object of enormous power for the human heart and can excessively dominate our lives. Even people who completely avoid romantic love out of bitterness or fear are actually controlled by its power. If you are too afraid of love or too enamored by it, it assumes godlike power, distorting your perceptions and your life. But after seven years of being madly in love, 
Jacob is beyond ready. He's beyond needy. He's beyond desperate. He's overwhelmed with, emotion, with emotional and sexual longing for a woman. So he goes to Laban and he makes that demand. Give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. Can you fathers of daughters imagine a young man saying that to you about your daughter? But you know, Jacob had been waiting and he had been working seven years. Just a side note. A person that loves that much might be the right person to marry along the way. Sometimes there are people who want to get married, but they don't want to pay any kind of a price. There's a price to pay for that kind of commitment. So we look at Jacob and we say, why did he do it? I believe that there is something here that we need to understand, and that is this. I believe that Jacob's life prior to Rachel was a bit empty. When he found her, remember, he had already, his father was dead. His mother was inaccessible. His brother hated him. He was separated from anybody and everybody. And all the longings of his heart for meaning and affirmation were now fixed on Rachel. If he could just have Rachel, everything would be all right. There are many people today that maintain the fantasy that if they could find their one true love, their soulmate, everything that is wrong with them would be healed. The problem is this. No lover, no human being is qualified for this role. No one can live up to these expectations, and the end result is bitter disillusionment. Jacob's emptiness made him vulnerable. So our story is about to take an interesting turn. In the 29th chapter in the 21st verse, after he says that he wants her now, Laban brings everybody together, all the people, and he gives a great feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah And he brought her to Jacob. Now, some of you are saying, how in the world could that have been even possible? How come he didn't know the difference? Well, there are several factors. One, it was dark. Two, she had a veil. Three, he'd been drinking a lot. How many of you know people look a little different after you've drank a little? Don't look at me like you've never, some of you've never, but some of you understand what I'm saying. She looked a little different. And in that moment, If that night, he gave himself to Leah, thinking it was Rachel. When morning came, verse 23, or 25, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Now, actually, if you looked at those words really closely, Laban had never promised to give Rachel to Jacob. Never had made the promise. He never actually agreed to the deal. Jacob was in love with Rachel, and he said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. You notice he never said, it's a deal. Let's shake on it, buddy. Never did. Jacob wanted to hear the answer yes, and so he heard a yes. Jacob heard what his heart was telling him. Jacob, a man who had been quite adept at deception, had been deceived himself, and it cost him seven years of his life, and he was no closer to his dream. You may wonder how Jacob could have been so gullible, but Jacob's behavior was that of an addict. There are many ways that romantic love can function as a drug to help us escape the reality of our lives. Our fears and inner barrenness made love a narcotic a way to medicate ourselves, and addicts usually make foolish, destructive choices. And this is what happened to Jacob. He worships the ground that she walks on is a saying how terribly destructive it is when that is literally the case. Most people have never desired another person as much as Jacob desired Rachel. And you may ask yourself, is it possible to love someone too much? The answer is no. But you can get things out of order. And you can put a person in the place of God. And when you do, you have put yourself in great danger. And also, you put that person in great danger. Laban has the upper hand now, and he knows it. Laban replied, it's not our custom to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, 
then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him the daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. Now, you've got to understand how this happens. There are seven days that they celebrate the marriage, and then at the end of seven days, he marries Rachel. Now this one man has two wives. This is a dangerous situation. How many of you know it's got real complicated now? When your hopes and dreams and happiness and fulfillment are wrapped up in a person, you've set them up as an idol in your heart, and the end result is never good, and it gets worse with time. In fact, if you follow the timeline of Jacob's life, you will find that Jacob's worship of Rachel created decades of misery in his family. He adored and favored Rachel's sons over Leah's, spoiling them and embittering the hearts of all of his children and poisoning the family system. But perhaps the greatest casualty was Leah. I mean, it just says she had weak eyes. And Rachel was beautiful and had a great figure. It's hard enough to be constantly compared to your siblings, but Leah was no match for the stunning Rachel. And now her father had confirmed her place by tricking a lovesick man into marrying her when he thought he was getting Rachel. Laban didn't think he would ever get anyone to pay the price for Leah. And now with his deception of Jacob, he gained a financial windfall. In one night, the daughter whom her father did not want became the wife whom her husband did not want. It was a terrible thing. She was the girl that nobody wanted. She had set her hopes on getting Jacob's love. And with a hollow in her heart, every big as the hollow in Jacob's heart, Leah began to pursue redemption. And in that day, the way for a woman to pursue redemption was to produce male children for her father, or for her husband. And so she, she got pregnant. When the Lord said that, saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son that she named, and she named him Reuben, for she said, it's because the Lord has seen my misery. So God has given me a son because he's seen how miserable I am. Surely my husband will love me now. Didn't happen. So she became pregnant again. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. And again, she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she says, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. So she named him Levi. What was Leah doing? I believe that she was trying to find happiness and identity through traditional family values. Would Leah ever be able to say, I'm made in the image of God, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made? Would she ever come to that place in her life where that was even possible? Because everything around her reminded her that she was not enough. She didn't measure up. She was never going to be what somebody else was. And let me tell you this much. Sometimes we spend our lives trying to be what somebody else is. And we never come to the place where we recognize that God has said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Leah sets all her hopes and dreams on her husband. If I can have baby boys, then maybe my husband will love me. And maybe just maybe I will be better than Rachel at something, at anything. And my husband will love me and I'll finally be his favorite. Instead, every birth pushed her into the barrenness of loneliness. She just got lonelier and lonelier. And every single day she was condemned to see the man she longed for in the arms of the one whose shadow she had lived in all of her life. The failure of romantic love as a solution for our problems is so much a part of our frustration today. Listen to me closely. No human relationship can bear the burden of Godhood. 
No person, not even the best one, can give your soul all that it needs. And when you finally realize this, there are only four directions that you will possibly go. One, you can blame the people that are constantly disappointing you. Two, you can blame yourself. Three, you can blame the whole world, including God. Or you can recognize that if you have a desire that no one and no experience in this world can satisfy, your happiness will only come as you pursue relationship with God. Because it's only there that you find out that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. After bearing three sons and finding yourself no happier, something happens. You see, Leah realizes that Jacob will never love her like he loves Rachel. It's just not going to happen, ever. It's just not. She comes to this understanding after she is pregnant for a, four, with, for a fourth time with a fourth son. Leah, in her desperation in this pregnancy, does something that is different than she's ever done before and maybe different than anything you've ever done. You see, she calls on God even when she is struggling and confused. She calls on him when her husband has again rejected her. In her despair and disappointment, she keeps calling on the Lord. And Leah's situation, even though it's not changed after years of childbearing, something is about to happen because she's calling on the Lord during this pregnancy. She's gone to God and she says, you know what? If I'm ever going to be affirmed in this world in a way that makes a difference, it's going to come from somebody higher than a man, somebody higher than a person, somebody that created me and made me and designed me and gave me purpose. Verse 35 of chapter 29 says this, she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, and I quote, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah, which means praise. And she began to praise the Lord now, not later, and the Lord, not Jacob. Finally, she has taken her heart's deepest hopes off of her husband and her children, and she's put them on the Lord. Jacob and Laban had broken Leah's heart. But when she gave her heart finally and completely to the Lord, she got it back whole and healthy. God has done something now remarkable in Leah. She will never again be defined by the love of a man. Leah's affection is for the Lord. She is fearfully and wonderfully made. And for the first time in her life, she knows it. She knows it. Her relationship with God has caused her to feel worth. Now, you got to get this part. You think of yourself, well, that's pretty good, right? But it gets better. It gets better. How many of you have ever said to yourself, if I could just have vindication? Huh? In Genesis 49, 10, Jacob himself, you know the guy that doesn't love her so much? Jacob himself speaks on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't even have any choice about what he's about to say. You got to get this. You got to get this. He says these words, the scepter. The scepter belongs to the king. The, Le the scepter. Leah's children are my favorite, but the Holy Spirit commands me to speak that the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nation shall be his. You know what he is prophesying of? He's saying Judah will be the leader and Judah will be the king and the tribe of kings will be the tribe of Judah and it will be praised. You gotta get this for just a minute. Mm -mm. Because there is one that will come along and he is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It is Jesus himself 
Leah, Leah, Leah. It's going to be from her the Messiah, the Savior of the world would come through. Judah, think about it. Salvation came into the world, not through the physically beautiful Rachel, but through Leah, the unwanted one. God came to the girl that nobody wanted, the unloved, and made her the ancestral mother of Jesus, the one that nobody wanted either. So let me ask you a question. Is Leah fearfully and wonderfully made? God says, yes, yes, a thousand times, yes. Yes, yes. And when Jesus came to this earth, he was truly the son of Leah. You say, well, how do you know that other than the genealogy? Well, Isaiah 53, 2 says this about him. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no former comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. I know people have this picture of Jesus as being really pretty until they messed him up on the cross. But what if he wasn't? What if this verse is truth? Because it is. What if he wasn't so pretty? We probably wouldn't hang pictures on the wall that we think looks like Jesus. But this says he has no former comeliness that... And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Leah was acquainted with grief, and so was Jesus. And he hid, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteem, and we esteem, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned all, every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Stop looking to a man or a woman to be your savior. You already have one. If you pursue Jesus You will experience the joy of knowing that God has designed you with purpose and a plan. There's an old song that we used to sing when I was growing up, and it goes like this. The world will try to satisfy that longing in your soul. You may search the wide world o'er, but you'll be just as before. You'll never find true satisfaction until you found the Lord. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only he can change your heart and make you whole. He'll give you peace. He never knew sweet love and joy and heaven too. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. This morning, if you've been disappointed by other loves, if you have felt like somehow you got shortchanged in the birth experience, or you've been compared with other people and you didn't feel like you measured up, it's time to turn the love 
of your life to the love of your life. And his name is Jesus. If you ever feel like you were, your birth was an accident, remind yourself of how you were truly created by God. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. So like Leah, you can say, this time I will praise the Lord. This time I will praise the Lord. Would you stand with me?